Thank you, uh, George. It's, it's great to be back here. I, I've made so many friends coming down here uh, every year. I, I feel it's my second home. Uh, it's uh, always a little dangerous to be the last speaker in the afternoon. Uh, if you must sleep, please try not to snore. Uh, I don't mind you sleeping. But just... As I go through my, uh, my presentation, please keep in mind what the last two speakers spoke about particularly as to Sergeant Jasper, uh, because the speaker who spoke about Jasper relieves me of part of what I was going to say, and particularly our last speaker who has related some modern military uh, terminology and thoughts to things that Francis Marion did. And this is very necessary because I believe very firmly that his early biographers had very little or no military experience and those who served with him had very little military experience, but he himself was one of the poor of people who had been provincial officers during the French and Indian Wars and were therefore trained by the British Army to be officers to the extent that they trained their own people to be officers. So he was pretty close to being a professional military person in the, in the colonies to the best that we had such people. And he was working for the most part with people who didn't have a clue as to what he was talking about and what he wanted to do. At some point, I think he encouraged that because it was easier for him to operate if people could not project what he was going to do. The um, topic I've been asked to speak about is uh, very broad. It has many heads to it. And when I was first asked to talk about Francis Marion and intelligence gathering and intelligence work, I was immediately put in mind of one of my favorite fictional characters. Uh, you may have heard him, Scrooge McDuck. Now Scrooge, I see some smiles, Scrooge was the rich uncle of Donald Duck, and he was a gazillionaire. And in the cartoon strips he had this money bin that was filled with dollar bills and coins, and his favorite occupation was to go swimming in his money bin. Now, Scrooge never missed an opportunity to invest his money or make more money. And I remember particularly this was a cartoon strip, and it shows Scrooge, and he's standing on a street corner, and he's selling books. And the book title is Scrooge McDuck's Secret to Success. And along comes this man, and he says, oh, wow, i got to have one of those. So he gives Scrooge a dollar, and he walks off of the book. And very shortly, he turns around, and he comes back, and he's all mad, and he says to Scrooge, there's nothing in here but blank pages. And Scrooge says, well, of course. It's a secret. If I told you, it wouldn't be a secret, now would it? <laughs> so to some extent, Francis Marion's secret of success is just that. It's a secret. He never told anybody. Us sitting here 200 plus years later have to look at a whole bunch of little clues and try to piece them together to try to figure out what was going on. Alexander Garden, who was one of Lee's officers and who served with Marion, uh, related that Marion, when it came to tactical matters, was as silent as the grave. He was not going to share with anybody what he was going to do or what he was thinking. And he had good reason. If, as the prior speaker said, people change sides very rapidly. About a third of the population only wanted to stay home, and they would do anything to please whoever walked into their barnyard, including enlisting until they could desert. Uh, so we have instances, for example, while Talton was chasing Marion, that Marion's scouts, his, not his scouts, but his guides, actually went over to Talton to tell Talton where Marion was. So Marion was as silent as the grave. He was so silent about things that we are told by some of his officers in their memoirs that when he first took command of the militia in Williamsburg, that several times, while the men were just kind of hanging about the camp, they suddenly got the order to mount up and leave. And the order was so abrupt, so little time was given, that when the men left, they had no food, no provisions, no water with them, they had no idea how long they were gonna be gone, and after being caught 
short several times and embarking on lengthy trips, two or three, four days, without adequate provisions, they then figured out the general wasn't going to tell them. Of course, he was a colonel at that time. So what they did was they watched Buddy, or Oscar, the general servant. And when they saw Oscar starting to pack Marion's things, and they watched to see how much food Oscar would pack, and they would then go and do likewise because they knew the general had something on his mind. This was how secret uh, Marion was with his thinking. Today, we would call that operational security. He liked to move at night. Again, operational security. He kept off of major roads. Again, operational security. He didn't want people knowing where he's going, how he was going, or when he was going. The other thing he did, and all this falls into the area of intelligence, but denying the enemy intelligence of himself. And this is very important to survival, particularly of a, a guerrilla or a partisan uh, who was operating in an area that is heavily controlled by the enemy. Now, uh, you indicated that, Mr. Colonel, I'm sorry, indicated uh, that a guerrilla and a partisan were somewhat the same. In Marion's time, the term partisan was simply used to denote a smaller unit than an army that operated in advance of or outside of the control of the main army. Not necessarily what we think today as guerrilla warfare. But still, Marion is out there by himself, surrounded by enemies. There is, for much of his early years of, year of operation after the fall of Charlestown, he's the only one there. And there are times when he is the only one from, I think, Virginia. He's the only really operational force. So he's out there by himself. He's very, very cognizant that he has to maintain security. He changes, according to Bass, thought he changed his location once every three days. He did not sit still. In fact, he changed his location so frequently that when Lee came down to join him, Lee couldn't find him. And when Lee tripped across some of Marion's scouts and said, you know, I'm Colonel Lee, I'm not Colonel Towton. Yeah, we both wear green uniforms, but I'm really Lee. And the scouts became convinced that this was a continental force. They couldn't find Marion. And it was several days of wandering around the woods between before Marion's own scouts could find him. So when you read Marion's letters, he really doesn't give you an awful lot of information on how he's operating. And this is because he doesn't trust anybody, which is a good thing in his case, a good thing for him to survive. We've had some talk about military strategy and military tactics. Um, Strategy is sort of the grand scheme, how we're going to win the campaign, how we're going to win the war. Tactics is how we're going to take that hill, all right? And in the 18th century, most military strategists would think of some grand gesture. We're going to capture New York. We're going to capture Philadelphia. Today we call it shock and awe. But the point is, some big battle we're going to win, and that's the, the theory. The other theory, which is a more modern theory, and Colonel Aiken, Aiken, is that correct? Spoke about this a little bit, was developed by a fellow by the name of Von Clausewitz, and he wrote a book in 1812 called On War, and he said, you have to identify that thing which allows the enemy to continue to prosecute the war. If you can destroy that thing, you can win, and that's what he called his center of gravity. Well, you have, and you have um, people like Sumter, and Green to a certain extent, thinking in terms of gathering large bodies of men to go out and have some glorious victory. And that's going to win the war. Well, Marion wasn't thinking in those terms. He was thinking in terms of very modern terms for waging war, <coughs> of let's destroy that thing that the army of Great Britain needs to succeed. Let's block their supplies, let's destroy their ability to recruit. So instead of gathering all of his men in one big central field where the British could come along and surprise them, as they did Sumter, as soon as he got his men together, he would send them out on patrols. And he did very heavy patrolling. He was constantly sending these patrols out to gather information and to disrupt the enemy 
this had a number of effects because the patrols, all his men wore little white feathers in their hat. If some Tories saw a bunch of guys going down the road with white feathers, Marion's over there! Well, Marion was over there, and he was over there, and he was over there, and he seemed to be everywhere because his patrols were everywhere. And by means of doing this, they were gathering information constantly. They were giving uh, support to our good guys, and they were discouraging the bad guys. Now, some of these patrols were, were wildly successful. And some of them weren't quite so successful um, because, well, he was dealing with people who weren't really soldiers for the most part. He had a core, a hard core of soldiers, but a lot of the guys were just, well, if you went down to the local bar and you said to a bunch of guys, come on, we've got this problem, they said, yay, we're all Americans, we'll go out and fight. That was the quality of a lot of the soldiers. So when Peter Ory went out on one of these patrols, he was a little bit less than successful. And the best way to do is just to kind of to give you a fever for the time, is to read what Ory said. They had been out on one of these patrols for some period of time, and he was supposed to go down and, and gather information and, and uh, act against the, the Tories. And they stopped at an inn to refresh themselves. And uh, they eat, and they start off again. And Ori writes, we pushed on after dinner in high spirits. I could not but remark, however, how constantly the men were turning up their canteens. <laughs> what plague have you got there, boys, he said. Why are you eternally drinking? Water, sir, water, nothing but water. The rogues are drinking brandy all the time. But by way of whipping the devil around the stump, they called it water, that is, apple water. <laughs> Presently, finding from their gaiety and frolicsomeness what they had been after, I ordered a halt and set myself to haranguing them for such unsoldierly conduct. But I might as well have been talking to a troop of drunken yahoos. For some of them grinned in my face like monkeys. Others looked as stupid as asses, while the greater part chattered like magpies, each boasted what clever fellow he was, and what mighty things he could do, yet reeling all the time and scarcely able to sit his horse. <laughs> Indeed, our guide, fetching one of his heavy lee lurches, got so far beyond his perpendicular that he could not write again, but fell off and came to the ground as helpless as a sack of flour. In short, my whole corpse were but one sober man, and that was Captain Nelson. Well, or he figured that if he led them into battle, it would be suicide. So he instantly ordered a retreat, which he says was made with all the noise and irregularity that may have been expected from a troop of drunkards, each of whom, mistaking himself for the commander in chief, gave orders according to his own mad humor and whooped and hollered at such a rate that I very believe that no bull drivers ever made half the racket. Well, when he got back to Marion, who apparently had a sense of humor, uh, Marion said, well, that's okay, you did the right thing by calling off the, uh, the patrol, but next time, keep an eye on the apple water. So, that was not a successful patrol, but many others were, and one of the things they kept looking for, of course, is evidence of the enemy. These patrols were able to gain superiority in small areas over small British units. And they were so good at this, and so good at capturing uh, the uh, messengers of the British, because you know we didn't have radios back then, so the only way you could communicate with your troops at, at distant posts was to send a rider. And these patrols were so good at capturing the riders um, that I think it was Rowan complained that you could not get a messenger from Charleston to Camden or supplies from Charleston to Camden unless it was a accompanied by an escort of at least 500 men. So Marion was tying up a lot of men. He was capturing the letters and the dispatches of the, the British officers, obviously reading them, gleaning information from them and acting on them. So this was all part of his ability to gather information. The uh, other thing that he did is he had a tremendous number of scouts and he put these people out at extreme distances, always 
trying to find out what was going on, always listening to what the enemy was doing and always reporting back. But scouting and information gathering for Marion was not limited to his patrols and to his scouts. He made it very clear that everybody in his organization was a scout. Everybody was supposed to, to be gathering information. And I'll read you a short section uh, from uh, uh, Johnson's Traditions and Reminiscences of the American Revolution. Although Johnson was writing in the 1850s, he was an old man at that time, and he had been alive as a teenager, so he knew a lot of these people. It said, Marion always enjoined on his men whenever they fell in with the enemy, it's all his men, whenever they fell in with the enemy or heard of them, that they should obtain all possible information of their number, their position, object, and course or destination. If anyone came in with imperfect account of the enemy, Marion not only appeared dissatisfied, but by his observations showed the reporter that he might himself be put to great inconvenience or danger by the want of accurate information, that they might be obliged to camp when there was no real occasion, or be ordered to pursue and attack the enemy when the enemy was too numerous for their division. So not only did Marion tell his men go out and get this information, not only did he make every man in his brigade responsible for getting information, and these guys were coming and going all the time, but he explained to them why. And this is very important from the point of view of untrained soldiers and even trained soldiers. The American soldier needs to know why. And Marion was telling his men why. He was always educating them. He may have been silent about what his operations were, but he was always telling his men why he was always training his men. The information gathering was not limited to his soldiers. And you have to remember that he was operating in an area that was technically under the control of the British government. And because of that, as some of our earlier speakers have told us, many people were required to take what they call the Oath of Allegiance or to seek protection. And that was, you went to the Brits and you said, I'll be a good citizen, don't, don't plunder my plantation. So Marion was a very good reader of character. And he realized that for an awful lot of people, they just wanted to be left alone. They really, they just wanted to sit home and watch TV, basically. But there was no TV, but they wanted to just be, be left alone. So he gave them an opportunity. It said, again in Johnson, Marion with judicious foresight and liberality encouraged the aged, the timid, and the wavering to take protection, and that is protection of the British, remain at home, well that was an easy thing for folks to do, and raise provisions for those under arms, and be protected by the Whigs, and be a source of information to him of the various maneuvers and advances of the British and armed Tories. So, in exchange for doing a fairly easy thing, at least a, on the surface, raising some food, letting the patriots take it from time to time, not all of it, just some of it, and providing Marion with information, you wouldn't get plundered. And this, of course, puts another spin on Marion's not allowing plundering. Because if he has a dozen or so folks out there who appear to be tourists because they've taken protection and they're feeding him information, he doesn't want them plundered. But he can't say, we're going to plunder you, you Tory, you Tory are going to be, be plundered, but you Tory are not going to be plundered. You Tory are going to be, well, wait a minute, something wrong here. Why isn't he being plundered? So Marion says no plunder for the reasons Colonel Aiken stated, because it's bad for discipline, but also because he was protecting his sources of information. And these folks gave him a tremendous amount of information that allowed him to keep ahead of the British um, and actually survive. One of his scouts were his scouts were very inventive. Um, one of them is, is said to have climbed a tree outside uh, Georgetown uh, at night, and he would stay in the tree all day long. And he could, from that tree, look over and see what the British were doing, and he kept track of how many Brits were coming and going and who was there. And then, uh, when the sun set, he climbed down the tree and he'd go report to Marion. That's a pretty inventive way of finding information. So these guys were out there 
all the time uh, working to get information. Marion also got information because he questioned prisoners. He also got information because there were deserters constantly coming and going, and he would always question these people and get information from them. When a POW was exchanged, he would pump them for information. Who did you see? Who was there? What was there? What were they doing? And so he was constantly doing this. When Green came into South Carolina, he asked Marion uh, to, to get spies for him, and Marion wrote back and said, well, you know, it's tough to get spies because they, they expect to be paid in gold and silver, and I don't have any. In some respects, Marion was not being 100% truthful with Green because he, you know, he read that letter casually, you would think that Marion had no sources of information, where in fact he had tremendous sources of information. And this may have been part of his uh, operational security. Marion ended that letter basically by saying to Green, I'll do what I can. And he immediately started sending Green good information. Uh, message security was vital in the revolution as it is today. And again, we don't have radios or uh, fancy encrypting. So what did they do? Uh, if Green wanted to say something to Marion that was very important, he would send a messenger who would have a memorized message. That messenger may also carry a written message to cover the fact he had a verbal message, but the most important messages were carried verbally, and Marion had a few very, very trusted aides, including a couple of his nephews, that would carry messages the other way. Another way in, in uh, the Revolutionary War that you had uh, security for messages was that um, you would use code names for your, your spies. Washington did that. The, the biggest spy ring was the Culpeper ring up in, in uh, New York. Uh, Green did the same thing. So when you read somebody's name in a dispatch, it may not be that person. That may be a code name. Some of the early types of, of um, encryption or message security is they had invisible inks. Uh, the simplest one was simply anything that was acidic which could go anything from uh, lemon juice to urine, and they would write between the lines of a letter that was chatty and just kind of non-controversial, and you'd hold that letter over a, a flame or, or heat, and the heat would cause the paper to yellow where the acidic uh, uh, ink, we'll call it, had been written. Washington actually developed a chemical invisible ink that required a chemical developer uh, to bring it forward. That was very advanced, and actually, that whole chemical compound has been lost to us. We really don't know what it was. The other thing they did sometimes is you would write a letter, and maybe every fifth word in the letter would be the real message. So the letter would say, oh, and Aunt Lily went down to see uh, Cousin Joe, and, and on the way uh, they saw Cornwallis, and then they went and they hung their washout, and, and then they baked apple pies, and they trooped along, and, you know, and, and so that, that would be one way you do that. Another thing they did is they had these cutouts, and maybe it would be a circle or a square or a squiggly or whatever, and everything inside that cutout, you'd have to put it on top of the paper. Everything inside might be the real message, or maybe everything outside would be the real message. That was another way of doing it. And then, of course, we get to codes, where you have numeric codes, and you have uh, words, numbers that are substituted for words and numbers substituted for letters. But if you use a numeric code, you need to have a code book. You need to have a key to translate that. And so, interestingly enough, uh, when we get to Fort Watson, uh, Marion writes the, the, a letter in existence from Marion to Green, dated April 23rd, April uh, of 1781, dated from uh, Fort Watson, and he writes, in my last to you, I gave the particular force and situation of the enemy. So clearly Marion is getting intelligence he's forwarding. Watson, that's Colonel Watson, cannot by any means move, and should he come this way, I think Colonel Lee and my brigade could give a good account of him. And if we had one field piece, we could reduce the redoubt at Nelson's and St. John's Church. I have, and the next word is, is obliterated so you can't get it. But I have in such a manner as to know the first movement of Lord Cornwallis. And that's interesting because he's, he's basically saying he has 
agents, spies, scouts, whatever you want to call them, going up towards Wilmington, watching what Cornwallis is doing. And that's a long way from his field of operation. And the next thing is very interesting. He says, I have a code book of Colonel Lee, which you may write when you want anything in particular you wish to communicate to me. So now, as of April 1781, the important messages between Green and Marion are going to be in code. They're not going to be in plain language. And then he says, the bearer, Mr. Slater, who was a British officer, now a spy, I beg leave to recommend to you, has been with me for two months just, and his behavior has given great satisfaction. Then he says, the ammunition we got at Fort Watson will be sufficient. He closes a view of the fort. I am your uh, most obedient servant, Francis Marion. So we have a, in that letter a view of several of his intelligence operations. He has a deserter. I'm sure the name is not Slater. But he's got a deserter for the British Army, and he's forwarding that deserter up to Green for Green then to get information from him uh, to do what, what Green thinks will be useful for the cause. Stepping aside for a second, this is much of what we know about Marion has to be told in stories, stories that came out written by old men and old ladies many, many years after the events. Henry Middleton was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, a very wealthy man in South Carolina. British come, take Charlestown. Middleton signs the Oath of Allegiance. Basically says, okay, I'm no longer an American, I'll be a good British citizen again. Middleton had sent his son, at some time in the past, to London to be educated. A young gentleman, looks very British, sounds very British, all the best British schools, dresses very British, looks like a wealthy upper crust guy. Uh, when the city of Charleston falls, young Middleton and one of his friends, who's also from South Carolina, decide they're gonna go home. They buy a whole keg of gunpowder, they buy a lot of flints, and they arrive in Charlestown, they go to the head of the Brits, and they say to the British commander, we have come here to raise a regiment for his majesty's service. You know, will you give us a recruiting sergeant? We want to go out into the country. And of course, here's these two great British gentlemen, and that sounds good to the British commander, so he sends a recruiting sergeant. They go out in the country, two young guys overpower the sergeant, go directly to Francis Marion, and they say, we're here to serve you as privates. Uh, we don't care we have British commissions. Here's the gunpowder, here's the flints, but there's a sign of our goodwill. Tell us what to do. Marion's very astute. He sends the, the two up to Green, because he can see there is a higher use for two people who look very British. And Green sends the two to Washington, and we hear no more of them until the younger Middleton is plowing his fields after the American Revolution. What they did is lost in history, but clearly they did something. Being a spy was not an honorable profession. You would not boast about it. And particularly in South Carolina, where you would have to come back and live with your neighbors and your friends, people who may have been loyalists with you, you don't want them to know that you were lying to them the whole time. And so people did not boast about what they did. There is, uh, there is another story we know uh, from one of our prior speakers that uh, Sergeant Jasper was one of Marion's most famous scouts. He was down scouting the British in, child, in uh, Savannah. He pretended to defect from the American army to get, in, to get information. He came back out. Uh, the word is that Marion gave him free reign. He was such a great scout. Does anybody know what's wrong with that story? Or what's interesting about that story? Sergeant Jasper, died at Savannah. Sergeant Jasper died at Savannah, that's right. Marion did not begin his partisan career until after the fall of Charlestown and after the Battle of Savannah. What could we imply from that? Simply that long before Marion was a partisan, he was an intelligence officer. He was on Green's staff, he was a member, not Green, he was on the Moultrie staff. He was considered to be one of Moultrie's family, as they called a staff officer back then. And we do see letters in Lincoln's writings, 
prior to the fall of Charlestown, where he's asking Marion for information, or he's being referred to Marion for information about the territory between Charleston and Savannah. So there is a possibility, and I think one quite arguable, that Marion was an intelligence officer even before he was a partisan officer. Now think about this. City of Charleston is getting ready to fall. Moultrie knows that. Marion has been Moultrie's right-hand man since the Indian Wars. Moultrie's the guy who thought enough about the fall of the city to take a whole bunch of gunpowder and brick it up in the walls in the old exchange so the British couldn't get at it. Why wouldn't he put in place, prior to the fall of the city, a intelligence network to get information about what was going on in the city to people outside the city? Why wouldn't he do that? And if he's done that, and if Marion is the intelligence officer who has been gathering this in the past, it certainly gives an imperative as to why it was necessary to get Marion, who was clearly not able to travel. He had to leave the city on the litter. An imperative to get him out of the city with this knowledge, to get into the country, not showing to be the partisan, but to be able to get information back and forth. In, um, the 1850s or thereabouts, and again I'm reading from Johnson, uh, a story arose that Johnson re relates, and I'll read it to you. One of the means adopted by General Marion to obtain information from Charlestown at the time of its occupation by the British forces during the American Revolution was reported to me a few months ago, before his death, by Mr. George Spidell. He was at that time a boy and very small for his age with a correspondingly childish deportment. He was employed by Mr. Joshua Lockwood to go in his large open boat under Captain Bellamy on trading expeditions between Charlestown and Georgetown. The boat passing through the creeks and inlets and marshes stopped, of course, at many of the intermediate landings and stayed as long as was necessary for the captain to make sales of the cargo, purchase produce in return, and transact any other business secretly or openly as he thought proper. In the secret transactions, the little boy Spidel was sometimes an unconscious agent being sent with a bundle of family supplies enclosed in other matters to a particular gentleman in the neighborhood. Sometimes he was taken secretly from Charlestown and landed secretly at a particular place. His papers delivered and forwarded to General Marion and on return of the boat would stealthily creep into his berth and come back to town. If he had reason to, to suppose his country friends, friends suspected him, he would pretend that he had run away and would be certainly taken up and given to Captain Bellamy, who was always, of course, very angry with him. Generally, he was sent with a basket to peddle various little matters among the neighbors, but charged to offer them first at a particular house where at least one of the articles was always selected. The rest were hawked about to avoid suspicion and promote trade. He was once actually taken up by one of the loyalists, but on account of his childish deportment and appearance, was soon set at liberty. Most commonly, he was landed openly and sent about with a handbill among the planters of the Santee, offering for sale the different articles specified in the handbill. When these expedients were exhausted, the little fellow who showed a hollow tree near the landing in which he was to lodge the packages given to him for that purpose. This is a fairly elaborate scheme of getting information in and out of the city, and clearly not one done on the spur of the moment. Uh, there are other stories about children. There's one about a little girl, and, and she relates this as an old lady. Uh, when she, her parents took her into their house, they said they left her in her room. They said a man was going to come into the room after the parents left and put something in her petticoat. She was up to allow him to do that, and then he would leave. Parents left the room after a while, a man came into the room, put something in the little girl's petticoat, and left. Parents came back in. They then went to visit their friends in the country. The reverse happened. The little girl again was left in the room alone. A second person came in, retrieved the article, left. The parents came back in. Plausible denial. The little girl, I don't know what happened. Parents, we were there. We didn't see what happened. And yet information was being passed. This is a fairly sophisticated a network of spies that are going on uh, back and forth from the city. As 
the war progresses, things start uh, to change. And uh, in the fall, or excuse me, the spring of uh, 1782, as an economy measure, uh, the governor decides the militia is no longer going to have horses. And now Marion Scouts is severely disabled because he no longer has the horsemen free ranging throughout the state. The British are pretty much confined to Charleston. The scouting activities are handed over to the Continental uh, Dragoons. They're not nearly as good as Marion's forces were. And in fact, I think some of the reasons that Marion has some problems right at the end of the war is because he's no longer developing his own intelligence for the most part. The, the, this is coming through the Continental Dragoons or through Ori's Dragoons or Mayhem's Dragoons who apparently just don't have the discipline and training to carry off the, the mission. The other thing is, is the militia at this point is being filled up with what they call 60-day men or 90-day men. These are guys who are former Tories that said if you serve in the militia for X amount of time, all will be forgiven. The guys who have been there, uh, who, who starved through the early campaigns, get a little disgusted, they go home. So you don't have the quality of men, and so Marion has some problems there. Uh, as the war is coming closer and closer to an end, the big problem is that um, the Continental Army has no clothes, it has no medicine, and now in the correspondence we start to see another black ox, as we would say today, with Marion. He apparently was running the black market. And with the consent of both Green and, uh, at that time, Governor Matthews. So we see uh, correspondence, very fragmentary, but we see correspondence where he's saying, I can get hold of blankets, cloth, everything to make a soldier comfortable. And what he's doing, he's not doing it for his own profit. He's trading food goods, tobacco, the things that are needed in the city for cloth, medicine, tents, blankets, shoes, the things needed by the Continental Army to survive and be comfortable. And at the same time, publicly saying there should be no commerce and stopping the commerce, the, the, the true black market uh, between the city and the country because he wants to control that trade because he doesn't want a few farmers getting rich, he wants the army supplied. And the Brits probably never knew who they were trading with, but they were trading with General Marion. This continues until the end of the war. British evacuate. And the last we see of Marion's intelligence operations is some letters that he wrote right at the end of the war from Charlestown after the city has been evacuated to the legislature trying to help his former informants. Because what's happened is the wars come to an end. There's a tremendous hate against Tories, tremendous hate against anybody who took the oath, who uh, sought protection. And when you read the journals, the early journals of the legislature as it's being reconstituted at Jacksonboro, while Marion's there, there's not an awful lot about confiscation. The minute he leaves, out come the hate lists, along with some people whose properties are going to be confiscated. It becomes a legislative enactment. It makes no difference if you're guilty or innocent. Your name is on the list. You have been banished by the legislature. Today, in our federal constitution, there is a provision that prohibits bills of attainder. That's what a bill of attainder is. When the legislature says, I don't like you, out. That's a bill of attainder. That can't be done anymore. But they did it at the end of the American Revolution. So what we see is Marion writing these letters that uh, Dr. Leno was one of the, the people I remember he wrote for, saying he, he took the oath, yes, but he did it so he could go into the prison ships and, and give medicine and care to our soldiers who were sick. And there were a couple of other guys, and I'm sorry I could not find the letters before coming down here, where he mentions uh, men who have been ordered by the legislature to go within the British lines to be deported, and they refused to go. And, of course, these people are in a horrible situation. If they go within the British lines, they then can't say, but I'm a spy for General Marion, because they're going to get hung. And if they stay in their own homes, they have a good chance the militia will pick them up and they'll be, they'll be abused. So they're really in a, in a bad spot. And Marion steps forward and he tries to protect them the best he can at the end of the war. And he's writing these letters uh, to try to protect them. So that is what I know about his operations. 
But we come back to Scrooge McDuck, the secret of Marion's secret service is it's secret because he never told anybody. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'll be happy to <laughs>